Welcome to the State of the School. The state of the MIT Sloan School of Management is strong, <laughs> as they say at the State of the Union address, even when it's not true. <laughs> but, but here, the State of the Union is, in fact, quite strong and is better in a number of respects. Um, I wanted to, I, I want to do only the very brief version of some of the dimensions of that and then have us have time for questions. Um, I know that there is an event in here at five o'clock and they need, uh, the folks need to have a little bit of time to set up for that event. So um, this is going to be the accelerated version of my attempt to mostly just remind you of some of the nice things about the school and important things and a few new things. Uh, hey, take a few questions and then, you know, I'm happy to see you outside in the hallways if you have further things that you'd like to chat about. We've never been a place that's about the buildings, but I do want to start about the buildings because some of you have noticed that there are buildings and there are new buildings and there are cranes for even more new buildings. Uh, with the billion dollars that MIT has invested in Main Street um, in new facilities, um, and then the over a billion dollar project that's coming on the Volpe site um, that will begin as soon as the Main Street site is finished. And there are just, a, and so I will talk about that. We'll talk about faculty a little bit. We'll talk about um, uh, cross campus uh, collaboration, in particular, the Schwarzman College for Computing. Um, and admissions uh, is going well in many respects, um, and there are always headwinds, and I'll tell you briefly about those, and then um, end with a, a brief thank you regarding the campaign. Uh, in Kendall Square, uh, you are here approximately, and uh, you've oriented, I hope, toward Memorial Drive and the river. And this is the way that it's going to look in about a year and a half, where um, I'm sorry to tell you that Eastgate Dormitory is going away. Those of you who lived in Eastgate, you know, if you make a really good sized donation, we'll give you a piece of the concrete from Eastgate uh, <laughs> as it comes out. It's not like a piece of the dome exactly, but um, you know, it's a thing. So what's happening is in uh, the addition to one Broadway, um, some housing and some new office activity and actually retail, um, I wanna promise you that in Kendall Square there will never be a pharmacy no matter how long you or your children live, but there is going to be a grocery store and so um, that is something new. Um, it's also the case in uh, buildings four and five, as you can see, uh, that in one of these two sites, there will be um, an innovation initiative hub that brings together many of the innovation and entrepreneurship activities for MIT in one place. Um, one of the concerns or criticisms have been that these things are great, uh, but they're all atomized. There's a little over here, a little over here, and so on, and we need to be able to get the benefit of bringing all of them together. And there's other stuff we've needed for a long time as well, as you can see. Um, part of this activity is also related to bringing companies closer to MIT, including research companies and uh, lab-based companies, um, companies that hire our graduates, companies that sponsor research here, and so on. Um, when the Stanford trustees came to campus recently, one of the things that they most noted about MIT is the benefit of walking proximity. And companies have asked us for exactly that. And so you see a bunch of that here. Um, and then there is more stuff coming along um, still um, not quite as soon, but very soon. And so over about the next year and a half, um, you'll see a much transformed Kendall Square. That's a little bit of a timeline on this. And then as I say, about a block further away, another billion dollar project with um, additional kinds of space is coming. Um, I hope that you know we have a great faculty and it continues to be a strong faculty. I wanna show you some pictures now just to remind you um, of a few points about the faculty. Not so much you know, these particular people and their particular photos, um, but to make a couple points about the faculty. So we hired six new faculty in FY20 to start this fall. Um, they're you know, a, a collection of uh, brilliant young people. We were very happy to be able to attract them. The point of this slide is not exactly that. Um, it's the number of offers that we made to people to join us in order to get these six. And I'm chagrined to have to tell you that we made seven offers in order to get these six faculty here. <laughs> One person went somewhere else. <clears throat> That person claimed to have family in Chicago and decided to work at the University of Chicago. This is a very strong place with respect to being perceived as a great home for research-oriented faculty that are about both rigor 
and relevance, and you see that here. Um, we also promoted some faculty. Um, for these four faculty, the thing that I most want to just mention briefly about them is three of the four do work on, uh, that at least uses AI, machine learning, big data, and so on. And so when we get in a few minutes to the Schwarzman College, the MIT Sloan School has been and continues to be at the forefront of big data and business analytics in ways that is very relevant to the institute going forward, not only to the world um, as it exists. Um, we also, on occasion, promote someone to tenure, and um, Hao Zhang Zhu is that person this year, um, who in the very best of MIT traditions um, has done research for which he has been much lauded that um, overturned some of the misperceptions about the flash crash in finance and overturned some of the misperceptions about what are known as dark pools, investment settings in which you don't know the identities of the purchasers or sellers of shares. And so um, he is already, if you will, a rock star in the world of financial institutions, how they operate and how they need to operate well. We made some new appointments to the faculty as well. Um, these are three professor of the practice appointments. Uh, Gary Gensler may be a name that you recognize from the Obama administration. Um, he was the chairman of the Commodities Future Trading Commission, including the group that regulated cyber uh, um, uh, blockchain and um, um, uh, cryptocurrencies and so on. Um, Zeynep Tone, some of you know through her work on the Good Jobs Strategy and the Good Jobs Institute and um, a path forward to both um, be financially successful and also pay people more than a living wage that they would wish to um, uh, makes them want to work for you. Um, and Rama Ramakrishnan, you know, relative to the previous slide, is someone who has a PhD from the MIT Sloan School in Operations Research, has built three different companies that were acquired successfully in the space of big data, business analytics, AI, and machine learning. Um, and he's decided that he doesn't need to um, make any more money and do that sort of thing, but he's going to come and help us both with respect to entrepreneurship and with respect to business analytics and machine learning and so on. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the Schwarzman College. Um, how many people have at least heard a headline or you know, seen something about it? So I, I don't want to take you back to too much of the basics of the college, but I do want to spend just a couple minutes on it and on the reason for it. Um, I don't need to talk to you about the role that um, con computer science plays in the national economy and the global business setting um, and the increasing role for machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, that has been a focus here at MIT for some time. The gift of Stephen Schwartzman allows us to both rapidly expand that activity and also reorganize some of that activity in ways that were much needed. Um, if you have a youngster in college, you know that there were many, 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 many collegiate undergrads who want to take a course in machine learning, and it is a real challenge to meet the needs and aspirations that some of those students have. As we build this college, it is um, the case that more, that is, it's not simply, it's not a silo, it is a mechanism for bringing together faculty from across the MIT campus, including very specifically the Sloan School faculty who are expert in AI and machine learning in order to play new kinds of roles for MIT and its undergraduate and graduate students relative to what they had been enabled to do previously. So there are real and important to the point that Brad Peterson was making in a prior session here at the Fireside Chat. Um, there, are, there have been and there must be great opportunities for the MIT Sloan School, not just to be a part of, but to be a leader in the Schwarzman College. And I've been very happy to see the development of those opportunities so far. Um, I think we talked about most of these other elements, um, including the need not only to have smart people thinking about uh, machine learning, but to think about the ways and to make real the ways that AI and machine learning can have a positive benefit um, in the country and in the world, um, including very much the ethics and social impact aspects of AI and machine learning, which is one of the pillars of the Schwarzman College. Uh, in the context of creating the college, um, something happened that would, I'm just telling you, never have happened 10 or 20 years ago. The co-chair of the working group to create the structure of this college had as one of the two co-chairs, well, one of the two co-chairs was the chair of the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department. That's not going to shock you, I hope. The other co-chair 
is a professor from the Sloan School, Nelson Repenning, whose expertise is in dynamic work design. And as an exec ed teacher and consultant, he is a leader in the way that you create new kinds of organizational structures that are effective. There was the goal and the very strong intent that the Schwartzman College would be a new kind of entity, certainly within MIT and likely within universities, focused on impact and broadly based. And so how great is it that the MIT provost and president would ask the Sloan School for its expertise with respect to organizing and managing a new activity? They've reached out, in fact, to the Sloan School faculty in a number of ways as new lab and center and department directors are appointed um, to give them, you know, a, if you will, a boot camp in managing well for MIT with the expertise of Sloan School faculty. That, again, I'm just telling you, is something that would never have happened 15 years ago. It is really a new day at MIT with respect to those points of connection. Um, I want to touch on admissions a bit. Um, it is, um, you know, common, and I don't mind coming to alumni uh, reunion weekend, showing dean charts where everything is going up and to the right and so on. Um, some of you have read enough headlines about applications to MBA programs to wonder whether that's a dean chart or it isn't. Uh, and so I want to touch on applications and admissions briefly, at least, but to tell you the truth, where we are and where we aren't with respect to MBA admissions. As we admit a class each year, we have 400 people who come into the MBA program. That is about half of the new graduate students that we admit each year because we have a set of other programs, Sloan Fellows, EMBA, Master of Business Analytics, Master of Finance. So MBA is one part of the overall portfolio, but it's half of the overall portfolio. And as you can see, applications are down between 10 and 15% over the last three or four years. That is typical for other leading schools. Um, it isn't the sort of dean chart that you look for. It's natural to ask why is that? Fewer people deciding to make the United States a centerpiece of their graduate management and professional education and opportunity is one piece anecdotally that we know is real. Um, another piece is a strong economy. Companies are paying people to stay longer in their organizations. God bless us all, everyone. Let's have a recession. Uh, yeah, maybe not from your perspective. And um, I, I'm thinking probably in 2021, but we, we shouldn't probably go there too far. Anyway, so um, I do want to tell you, though, the truth and the whole truth. And I think, uh, you know, to the extent that um, the sky is falling. The sky is not falling today. Um, I wanted to show you as well on the bottom of this chart um, the number of people that we admit to matriculate a class of 400. Our yield is about two thirds on admissions. So we admit about 600 people in order to get 400 people in the class. And so you see the 4,900 or so applicants uh, for this period of time. Um, and we admit 600 of that, uh, that 4,900. And so uh, our admission rate is about 12%, between 12 and 13%. It's an extraordinarily strong class in a number of respects, including you know, some of the stylized metrics like the GMAT score of the class. And so as the number of applications has declined at least a bit, what's happened to the quality of the class? The answer is it's gone up at least slightly. Um, there are other measures of quality as well, but they're all kind of similar to this. And so um, there's much more that I could say if we had more time. Um, I, I want you to know that we're concerned about the application numbers. Um, we are determined to have a broad for portfolio of programs that will offer a variety of approaches for what we know to be valuable, which is management education. People want more of it, but they want it in new forms. And we need to be able to be right for those new forms that people are looking for. Um, I also want to touch on a new um, approach to um, MBA application for MIT Sloan. Um, so those of you who have um, children, nieces, nephews, maybe grandkids and so on, you, who are graduating from college, one of the things that you might want to point out to them if they're doing very well is that we, um, like um, a couple other leading schools now, um, offer college graduates or graduating um, seniors the opportunity to pre-apply for an MBA program. Um, and if they are extraordinary, we will admit them to that program now. They have to go work for between two and five years. They can come at any time during that two to five year window that they would like. And um, the, um, let's see, they, 
uh, you see a number of things about this. If you're an MIT undergrad, then you don't have to take the graduate management admission test or the GMAT test. Um, if you have a high grade point average. Um, I'll show you a couple statistics here. Uh, this is the first time that we ran this program. It was a, with a relatively short announcement lead time. We had uh, a total of 492 applications. We admitted 141 people. Um, now, when we admit them, that doesn't mean that they pre-commit to come. They have to place a, a deposit down in order to um, uh, hold a place, if you will, for two to five years from now. So far, 43 of those people have done that. Um, their average GMAT is quite extraordinary. Um, by the way, these um, admitted students include the president of the MIT undergraduate senior class, um, also the um, uh, chair of the student senate for MIT's undergrads. Um, these are people that we are very excited to have in the MBA program when they're ready. And they are people who were coming to us two, three, four years ago asking us for help so that they could apply to the Harvard Business School or Stanford Graduate Business School two plus two program. <laughs> I mean, I don't really wanna help them go someplace else a couple of years down the road. Um, if you will, in our history, we've seen, frankly, too much of that from MIT undergrads, and we want the best of them to stay here. And so I'm confident more of them will. Our other programs continue to be strong. I won't do the long version of that in light of the overall amount of time. Um, but um, applications are strong in these other programs. Um, typically um, over 10 or in the neighborhood of 10 applicants per seat for the pre-experience programs, the Master of Business Analytics program and the Master of Finance program. The more senior programs are also doing extremely well. The Sloan Fellows program, average age 40, mostly international. And the Executive MBA program, also average age 40, mostly domestic. So those two programs are kind of a complement for each other at the senior level. If you look at what's happening to management education at the graduate level, it is becoming less 28-year-old career switchers which was always gonna happen. How much of management education should be for 28-year-old career switchers? I mean, some, but not 80%. And where it's going is some of it to be pre-experience and some of it to be more senior programs. And that is the direction in which we've taken our programs. Okay. Um, all right, so I've, we talked about this. Uh, the MIT campaign has been a point of focus and a point of pride for the MIT Sloan School. Um, I hope some of you noticed that the Pi Day Challenge and Pi Day, everybody knows when Pi Day is, right? March 14th, we do the 3.14159 of that. And um, very excited, it's a time for the community to come together and support each other, but also support the school. Um, so look for that again um, next March. There are a number of campaign successes to the date that make me very proud, but also very grateful to you and your fellow alumni and friends, and increasingly non-alums as well, who see MIT and the Sloan School as doing really important work in the world, and together with you, they wanna support MIT Sloan, and we're very grateful. And so, um, I think that's mostly what I wanna to touch on here, uh, and maybe to make a very small point, and that is that um, if you look at the overall giving, um, it is from all different kinds of people, all different parts of the world. Um, on a per capita basis, actually international donors are giving more than domestic donors. So for all you domestic donors, I ask what's, you know. Um, <laughs> if we engage well, I'm confident and have been confident that the support will be there no matter where in the world someone's coming from, no matter what their cultural background may be. That has been our experience during the campaign and over the last 10 years, and I'm confident it'll continue that way. So some things I hope will not change, hardly ever or maybe never. Uh, mind in hand, rigor and relevance, no trade-off between them, we just have to have both. It needs to continue to be a cornerstone for us. The MIT Sloan School mission, principled, innovative leaders who improve the world, I mean, we're quite serious about that. Our students are serious about it. Our faculty are serious about it. Our young alums know the mission and talk to each other about it. Invent the future, it, it may sound a little highfalutin, but if we don't do it, who's gonna do it? And doing it for a better world. There are some things that are changing. Delivery models for management education are changing. Sources for funding are changing. Who will pay for ideas that really are valuable in moving 
organizations forward. Increasingly, it's not going to be a cross-subsidy from tuition. We need to be thoughtful, mindful about that, and our faculty have been. Um, and then how we create the opportunities for ideas from this faculty to make a difference in the world, to make a difference in real organizations. Um, in other words, the ways that we convene both online and in person, these reunions are one piece of that. Please keep coming to them and please give us your voices about how we can make them better. I hope that you see improvement in them. I hope that you continue to come. So with that, I think we have about almost 15 minutes uh, for questions. And we have a microphone. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, my name is Roshni Hirjibahadan. I'm an MBA 2014. Um, so thank you so much for the overview in our brief time today. It was really great to hear that the state of our school is strong. Um, while I was at Sloan, I was very involved both inside the classroom and outside the classroom in all things related to biotech, healthcare, and pharmaceuticals. I've indeed gone on to um, spend the last five years in pharmaceuticals. I have noticed in all the companies I've been in, there is a trend to move pharmaceutical companies here to the Boston area. People are moving from Chicago, major operations to this, um, to this part of the country. Um, my question is, what are we doing at MIT Sloan to get ahead of that trend and be that cutting, age, cutting edge partner to the pharmaceutical and biotech industry? Mm -hmm. uh, they seek, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something easy about that, maybe, and something not so easy. So they have a number, a number of interests that have them, as they come here, seek us out really, I mean, just locking right onto our shoulders. It's like, if we wanted to keep them away, we couldn't. And so um, I, I don't worry about that too much. I mean, we may worry about the best ways to engage with those firms. Um, some of the leaders of those firms uh, um, are actually MIT Sloan and MIT alums as well. Um, they're interested in manufacturing and innovations in manufacturing. They're interested in search for new drugs and our insights um, with respect to organizational processes there. Um, they're interested in um, the way that kind of um, intrapreneurship uh, might work for an organization like that. They're interested in new ways of financing, uh, pharmaceutical uh, drug discovery and testing and so on. Um, and our faculty are very relevant to them in those areas. Um, I, I, I am concerned on behalf of MIT, I mean at least a little bit, that, um, that the companies that, so we are creating capacity for companies to come here um, it's, a, it's not like our admission process. We saw the slides earlier. You know, it's not as if, and I want to say this the right way because I'm really, really, really happy that those firms are here, but we don't apply an admission standard to the firms that choose to come here. And one of the things that I've talked with uh, my friend Nitin Noria about, he's the dean of the Harvard Business School, is on behalf of the region, how do we try to ensure, not only in life sciences, but including in life sciences, that we are attracting, in some sense, the right companies or the best companies, or you know, that we are not only the recipients of interest from whoever is eager, wise, desperate enough to want to be here, but that we are more proactive and thoughtful about that. And so I don't want to suggest we're at the end of that path, but I am concerned about that. Tokun Boshawoi from the class of 99. Uh, I'm the chief operating officer of the New School, which is University in New York City. Can, can you just, a little bit more volume and a little slower, please? Thank sure. you. Sure. I'm usually not accused of being quiet. Uh, <laughs> Tokumbo Shawal, I'm the class of 99, MBA, and yes. I'm the chief operating officer of the New School, which is a university of about 10,000 students in Manhattan. Yes. And so I was intrigued by your comments about the changing, the evolution of uh, graduate education and, and the shift to older and younger students. And so given it's our 20 year reunion, I'm curious if you were to look 20 years in the future, how do you see Sloan being very different? And it's difficult for all those of us who are invested in the way we were educated, but I think it's really important as an innovative institution to think about the future in sort of a Wayne Gretzky state to where Puck is going to be as opposed to being wedded to where we are. Yes. So what's your vision of Sloan, MIT Sloan in 20 years? Do you still have an MBA program? I mean, that's sort of sacrilegious, but really thinking about the changes in the economy and the needs of the, yes. the workforce and what does that look like? Thank you. Uh, 
you know what they say about predicting the future, that you know, prediction is difficult, especially of the future. So uh, let's take this with a bit of a grain of salt. But one of the trends that I think will continue for a long time is the just-in-time modularization, maybe atomization of management insights, management knowledge, management education. Less of a desire to, if you will, buy all of it at once and more of a desire to get it in various pieces that will take you some particular place that you want to go. And that will not only be to a career switch kind of choice um, at age 28 and so on. So that modularization is a, is a, is a trend. There are, there's a yin and yang, there are two different trends that sometimes are made to be in opposition to each other that I don't think are. One is a trend to online education or online learning or you know online. And the other is an increasing sense of the value of personal experience. Experience of a network, experience of um, a stressful learning environment within an organization, um, the experience of being with a thought leader and seeing their mind in live action being right like this, not like right on some screen with them. There's more of that as well. Both of those are trends, or at least are seen as having value for the foreseeable future. What we've been doing in the MBA program, in some ways, has been putting more of those together with each other. Some of the pre-experience, some of the, the, the preterm stuff goes online. Some of us do flipping the classroom kinds of things, and we focus on high touch, high value experiences that our students have to choose if they're gonna work. We do a course um, called um, the Global Entrepreneurship Lab that has our students, about 170 of them, um, going off for four weeks to the country of Colombia or Vietnam, in other countries as well. None of them have fully developed economies, if you will, um, seeing how big a difference they can make with an entrepreneurial small venture that's high risk, that's trying to make a positive difference in their particular part of the world, to have had a small experience over a year, um, because the course runs for a year, and then a deep experience on the ground for four weeks, is a dramatically changing kind of experience for those who choose it not just in putting accounting and finance or accounting and marketing together, but in seeing the impact that an individual can have in an organization. That has value. Companies know that those kinds of experiences have value. They sometimes look to us to help expand that set of opportunities for them. That's gonna be a part of the future, but how it's packaged, when it's bought, what kinds of value we ask and get for that, um, all of that's gonna to continue to change. Um, in 20 years, there will be more people who are able and inclined at age 60, not 40, to be doing things looking at their next stage of life um, with respect to being board members or investors or working in nonprofits or helping nonprofits and, and sometimes helping their own family um, think through the future. Um, there are other schools that are putting a bigger toe in the water around that than we are right now. That's a little bit about changes to come. Uh, I, I see a hand here, and I, I don't mean to grab the um, control. Oh, I'm sorry. If I'm, okay. You guys tell me where I should um, be looking, and I, I will look there. Um, I, I spent most of my career working in um, outside of the United States. Uh, what I see is that INSEAD has a global campus now with a connection in China, in uh, Singapore. Mm -hmm. um, I see LBS making the same moves. When I lived in India, I, I used to see a small office for HBS yes. right next to my house. Yes. So um, in, in, a, in a highly globalized and very decentralized market, mm -hmm. what are the uh, opportunities for MIT? Even in, the, I, I live in Korea now, outside, like yeah. a, a stop away from a small town, not even in Seoul. We have a global campus where you have a number of US schools. I think Albany's there, yes. another 
European school is there, as well as many others. So I'm just yes. wondering, what's the vision for MIT in yes. globalizing in that way? Yes, thank you. Um, it's a great question, and I'm going to probably not do full justice to it because we'll need to, that'll have to be the last question in terms of the amount of time that we have. Um, engaging globally is important. Figuring the right ways for a particular school in order to get that engagement is also important and is increasingly customized. Different leading North American schools are doing it in different ways from each other. There are some experiments that are ongoing and there are some that are starting and there are some that have failed that schools are closing down as they can. One of the experiments that has not proven successful is creating a <clears throat> small venture office place that you can do um, uh, conference kinds of uh, convening in other places. They're not full enough at the time, they lose money, they don't really provide meaningful engagement with those regions. We never did one. The schools that did regret that they did. They've lost money on them, they're closing them down. I don't mean that to suggest doing nothing is the answer, but I think it's important to take the learnings from other people's experience and the learnings from some of our own experiences, which have mostly had to do with a partnership model, partnering with Chinese uh, uh, leading universities, um, playing the role that we play in Malaysia with the, um, um, the new school that's been created uh, there, uh, the Asia School of Business. Um, we've played leadership roles in Portugal and other parts of the world with partners. Um, we had a partnership in Turkey that I think made a positive difference for some time. The situation there changed in ways that you probably know about. Um, we ask our faculty, are you learning and being able, you think, to make a positive difference in some part of the world? And that's what tends to lead our efforts in a particular place. <clears throat> um, I would maybe then take um, a slightly more controversial half a minute um, to say that, uh, so I, I'm a big fan of Gabriel Hawawini. Uh, Gabriel was the dean at INSEAD who had the courage to do a fully two-campus model. Um, it's been a challenged model for INSEAD, but perhaps especially because they don't have an endowment that's meaningful. Um, they rely too much on MBA degree program tuition the pattern, I mean, they're at a much less advantaged place with respect to MBA applications than we are. Um, and they rely too much on executive education, which is very cyclical. It's not anti-cyclical or um, counter-cyclical. And so would I like to be INSEAD? Honestly, um, I did a review of them recently. I would absolutely not like to be INSEAD relative to being us. There are other leading schools that have uh, branch campuses, um, the University of Chicago has a campus in London um, that is small that they do, that they fly their faculty to for executive MBA and one in Hong Kong. I've never understood honestly how the world is a better place if you fly your faculty to Hong Kong to teach the same accounting course that they would teach in Chicago. I, I mean, I just don't get that. It's a little tough, but those schools know that I feel that way. Um, London Business School has opened uh, real campuses in two other places that are losing money for them. So that's the global landscape of what other schools have been doing. Um, there's another trend in management education that I would leave you with, and that is the prominence of place. If we talk about <clears throat> the earlier question about what do we see 5, 10, 15 years down the road, more and more of our executive education clients even though it's more expensive, they want to fly their people here to Cambridge, Massachusetts, rather than to have one faculty member fly to where their people already are. The reason they want to do that is because they feel there is something special and special to be gained to be at MIT and hopefully through time to be of MIT. One of the things that we need to do is to have MIT be an interesting enough place and a place that is seen well around the world, including through our partnerships. That's a work in progress. I, I feel like you have a follow-up that you want to ask, um, and so I want to give you the chance to do that, even though it's going to have to be brief for both of us. Yeah. The analysts, 
they don't want to go to MIT. They're like, yeah, but that's the US today. Yeah. So I yeah. think one needs to reflect that. The yeah. second question is that, yeah. yes, maybe initially it's a loss for these campuses, but given the demand that I see just from my little demographic, yeah. longer term, it could be a larger and more profitable opportunity. I'm just I, I understand, and it's good to, you know, it's good to challenge assumptions. Um, they're not going to be there longer term, they're closing them down. Uh, I'm just telling you, that's what's happening right now. Um, it is, though, true that more and more people around the world are wondering whether they would come any place in North America for um, education of any kind, including management education, and I'm quite concerned about that, and I hope I didn't sound like I wasn't concerned about that before. Um, we hope for great change there, and in the meantime, to have ourselves be well understood as an extraordinarily welcoming community, and one that is able to help people with an extraordinary and distinctive global future. Um, but that is not an easier story to tell today than it was five years ago. That's just a truth, and I appreciate your pointing it out. Um, I hope there's enough common ground, but also some room for thinking new thoughts. Um, for me at least. I, I need to stop here because the room needs to be reconfigured for what's coming next. Thank you so much for this, it's been great. Thank you.